Till death do us part. That's today's lesson as Steve Flatt continues the series for Keeps. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Hi, I'm Steve Flatt, and welcome to the Amazing Grace Bible Class. Today we're concluding our series that's been going on for seven weeks. The series has been called For Keeps, A Study in Lifelong Marriage. Well, we're going to close that series, I guess the way you should close a series about marriage. The title of the lesson is going to be Till Death Do Us Part. We're going to talk about aging in marriage life, the, the empty nest syndrome, and then even thinking about dealing with the death of a spouse. Uh, sometimes those are very sensitive and serious subjects, but let's see what the Bible has to say about them. We're going to get to that lesson time in a few moments, but first we're going to enjoy a time of singing together as we praise the Almighty God who came up with the concept of marriage and everything else that's good. Sing with us at home. Sweet is the song, song I sing today. stage for our lesson today, Till Death Do Us Part, I wanted us to interview a couple uh, who've been married a pretty good number of years. And this is Jim and Marjorie McDougall, uh, good friends and, and good brother and sister in the Lord. Jim and Marjorie, how long have you all been married? 36 years. You agree with that, Jim? I just want to say you're with 36 years. <laughs> 36 years. Sometimes they're long years, sometimes they're short. <laughs> well, that's good, Jim, but we're not going to get into that. <laughs> No, really we are. That's, that's really what I want to talk to you about. Today's lesson is going to focus in on, on aging in marriage. Um, the two of you are retired, aren't you? Right. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you, as you look back over those 36 years and uh, raising children and all that's involved in that, what were some of the critical adjustment periods that you had to go through in marriage? I guess the first one, I had to convince her that she <laughs> needed to stay home with the kids and quit her job. And... Uh, well, the kids is what kept us together, really, all, all through it. Well, was it a difficult thing when you experienced what the sociologists call the empty nest syndrome when the last child left home? Yes. Yes, it was. <laughs> More for me than it was him because he was still okay. working. Okay. Did you feel, Marjorie, did you kind of feel a sense of time I, on your hands, alone, uh, loneliness, that type of thing? I was very lonely. How would you cope with that? Well, I just went right on with what I had always done, and I stayed in touch with my children as much as possible. And then, of course, grandchildren came along, and it was great then. Now, that helps. <laughs> okay. You're stealing some of my lesson, Marjorie. That's all right. That's, okay. uh, that's what we were, this is the setup anyway. Yeah. Well, all right, so you were at home then, and, of course, grandchildren right. helped fill the void, and you were working, Jim, but now mm -hmm. how long have you been retired from day-to-day -day active work? Well, I retired twice. That's the first time I... <laughs> Uh, I was retired about eight months, and then uh, it's been a little over a year the second time. All right. Well, now that's been an adjustment period, hasn't it, for both of you to be officially mm -hmm. retired? Right. What are you doing with your time? How are you spending your time in that stage of life? Right now we're fishing. <laughs> <laughs> we're fishing. And it's kind of embarrassing because she outfishes me. Oh, is that right? <laughs> 
Uh oh. Well, but you you fish together, and I think it's important. Right. Fish oh, yes. Uh, did, have you always been fishermen or fisherwomen, or did you did you kind of take this up as a hobby you could do together after you retired? No, we did it when the children were little. Okay. And then we quit after the children left home, and then when he retired, we took it up again. Okay. Okay. So it did have uh, something to do with these transitions. Right. Family. Okay. Well, that's good. We're going to talk about that in a few moments, and. Uh, what you're doing is something that I, I think is exactly what God would have couples to do as they go through those transitions, is to keep that common interest. And we're going to talk about another phase here in a few moments. We're going to talk about something that uh, you two have not had to experience, nor I, but a lot of people have, even people that will be viewing, and that's the death of a spouse. Um, you know, it's no secret that you all have spent more years together than you're going to have in the past than you're going to have in front of you, right. even under the best of circumstances. Do you ever think very much about losing the other one. Yes, we uh, do. Yes, I you think talk about, about it. that. Mm -hmm. what, what do you say? I mean, and, and what are your feelings about that? I hear some couples say, "I hope I'm the one who goes first, or the other." One, you know, <laughs> he says so, that. You're the one who goes first, you know. <laughs> he says that. He says he can't live without me. <laughs> He's he probably take, right. He can't take care of himself. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's why God arranged for about eight times more widows than widowers, don't right. you? Right. Uh, and I know that's, that's a, a sensitive and sometimes maybe even for some people a morbid thought, but it's a reality. And that's something that we you know, just have to deal with. I want to ask you one more real question here then, before we get into our uh, lesson time. Uh, the young couples that are viewing right now, uh, that are just launching into marriage, give them a, I've been teaching them for seven weeks, but. I'm not all that old myself, Jim. Give them a, a word of wisdom from a couple who've been married as long as you have. Just stay together and work out. Never go to bed without getting whatever problems you've got solved for the day. Right. I mean, don't go to bed mad. Make up. Marjorie, you got anything? He always says, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we see who has to say they're sorry again. I really appreciate Jim Marjorie. great. That's great. And uh, we appreciate your sharing those things with us. We're going to sing another song together, and then we're going to have today's lesson. This is going to be our final lesson in our series for Keeps, a study of lifelong marriage. And that's what we've been trying to promote. We've been trying to promote what God wants. That is, a man and a woman saying, I do, and staying together until one of them should depart through death. Well, we're going to talk about three phases in the latter years of marriage tonight. And obviously, we won't be able to say everything that needs to be said about them, but maybe some highlights that need to be brought out. We're going to talk, first of all, about the empty nest. That's when the last child has left home. You may have heard me say earlier in the series, by the way, that that is the second most common year when divorces occur. Isn't that amazing? Sometimes couples married 30, 35 years when that last child's left home. Second only to the first year of marriage because oftentimes it brings with it problems. The second phase we're going to look at real quickly will be growing older together, the aging process and what that means to a couple. And then finally, that third part, till death do us part the death of a spouse. Let's talk about the empty nest, uh, the empty nest. Two suggestions that I think are very, very crucial that we're going to put on our video board here. Number one, plan for your empty nest and for your retirement. Plan for that, all right? And I want to talk about the empty nest. In other words, as you raise your children, understand that the time is going to come when they will leave home. That's been God's plan all along. Uh, a lot, I know that sounds simple, but a lot of people forget that. Do you realize why uh, God gives children to parents? 
You ever stop to think about anything that basic? There are two basic reasons. Number one, and this is primary, is for their development. Isn't that right? In Deuteronomy chapter 6, way back in the Old Testament, after giving the commandment that Jesus repeated centuries later about loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, he then goes on, Moses does, to say in verse 7 of Deuteronomy 6, impress those commands on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk down the road, when you lie down and when you get up. You see, God gave children to parents primarily because you will never conceive of a better training ground for their physical, emotional, intellectual, and most of all, spiritual development. Ephesians 6 verse 4 in the New Testament says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, here's that primary purpose, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. So purpose number one for having children is for their development. But there's a second purpose that ought not be overlooked. It's for your enjoyment, parents. It's for your enjoyment. Children are fun. They're a blessing. Listen to what the psalmist said in Psalm 127, verse 3. Sons are a heritage from the Lord. Children, a reward from Him. Those of you who have children, if you think your children are a reward from the Lord, nod your head right now, okay? Amen. Everybody agrees with that. I've got three. I've got three. They're each unique rewards <laughs> in their own way, aren't they? All of them little, little individual packages. You don't know what you get until they're growing up, you know. I've got one 11 and a half right now, one eight, one five. I know my teenage years are coming. I understand all that. But you know something I've learned? I've learned to appreciate your children at each stage of his or her development. Haven't you learned that? Those of you with kids, isn't that great? Joy holding them when they're a little baby and they can't run away and walk, but then watch them explore. And then watch them begin to talk to you and to feel the hugs as they begin to sense your identity. And then to watch them grow up and begin to spread their wings a little bit as they near adolescence. It's a beautiful thing. Now, with those two points in mind, don't, don't go to the extreme. Don't focus totally you know, on the idea that my only job is to train them. Or on the other extreme, my only job is to enjoy them. I'm supposed to be doing both all the way through. And I find that a lot of couples, as they raise their children, go to one of two extremes. They'll, they'll say, well, you know, as soon as the last one's here, they cost so much money and they're so busy, they begin counting the years until that last one leaves home, you know. Say, well, I'll tell you what, just another, I'll, be, I'll be 53 when that last one leaves home. We'll get a Winnebago, go down to Florida, you know. We'll do all these things we've always wanted. You know, they can't wait till that child leaves. That's not the way you want to be. The other extreme is just as dangerous. The other extreme is where your whole lives are wrapped up in those children so that when that last one does leave home, you no longer have anything in common. In fact, you have lost the essence of your relationship. That accounts primarily for the reason that it is the second most common year for divorce. And I'm sure that uh, when our last child leaves home that I'll experience something that Jim and Marjorie did. It is difficult because you can't help but revolve a good portion of your lives around those children. But be careful not to revolve them all. Empty nest, number one, plan for that. Now look at the second point under this. Diversify and unify your interest. <laughs> you say that's, a, that's contradiction in terms. <laughs> diversify and unify your interest. No, diversify with regard to scope. Why? As you retire and as your children leave home, you're going to have more time than you've ever had. You need to look at diversifying your interest. Maybe taking up fishing. Maybe both of you golfing. Maybe traveling if you have funds available. Sinking more of your time in church work. Or maybe being a hospital volunteer. All of the above. Diversify your interest, but at the same time, unify them. And the unifying being, do it with each other. Knowing that you've lost some of those pieces of common ground in those children that have now gone to establish their own lives. You've got to reestablish common ground with your mate. That's why I think it's so good when older couples seek the same hobby and, and just enjoy that time together even as they involve themselves in something that's fun or work. That's the empty nest. Now let's look real quickly at growing older, the second stage I wanted to talk about today. You know, we are growing older as a country. Statistics tell us that in 1985, the median age in this country, median age means right smack dab in the middle, half the country younger, half the country older. 1985, the median age in America was 31. The median age today is almost 34. It's the middle age. By the year 2000, the median age in America is projected to be 36. And by the year 2050, the median age is predicted to be 41 and a half. 
We are growing older as a country. In 1940, the percentage of our population that was over 65 years of age was 6.8%. In the year 2000, it's going to be 13.1%. And listen to this. By the year 2050, according to projections, we don't know, but this projection, they project that 41% of the population in the year 2050 will be over age 65. So we're growing older both married people and single people, we've got to understand aging. There are two key views of aging. One of them is what I call the gloom and doom view of aging. You know, it's just, it's the worst evil that could happen, and I'm going to fight it with every cream and with every solstice and with every vitamin, you know, that's going to come down the bottom. I don't want to grow old. You know, you fight it tooth and nail, you'll end up coming to the same conclusion that Solomon did in Ecclesiastes 12. Let me read something to you. Solomon wrote, and in, in, in Ecclesiastes, it's his journal of frustration. But he finally comes to a great conclusion at the end about fearing God and keeping his commandments. But listen to his frustration. Remember your creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars grow dark and the clouds return after the rain. That means the eyes begin to fail. When the keepers of the house tremble, the strong men stoop and the grinders cease because they are few. What are the grinders ceasing? Because your teeth, lose your teeth. When men rise up at the sound of birds, but all their songs grow faint, what's happened? Lose your hearing. When men are afraid of heights and of dangers in the streets and the almond tree blossoms and the grasshopper drags himself along and desire is no longer stirred, the man goes to his eternal home and mourners go about the streets. That's, that's pretty down, isn't it? And that's where Solomon was. He had, he had tried to, to hold off aging. He wanted to enjoy life. Epicureanism, you know, eat, drink, and be merry. That was his whole quest. And he finally found out you can't keep it away. And if you look at it just as the ultimate, the ultimate evil, it's going to overcome you and you will be miserable. There's a second way that you can age, though. You can age with dignity. You can age with dignity. Let me read to you here from uh, Proverbs 16, verse 31. Gray hair is a crown of splendor. It is attained by a righteous life. Isn't that great? In other words, you can grow older thinking, this is part of God's divine plan for me. There are a lot of myths about aging in our culture that really need to be abolished. Let me share some with you. I jotted a few notes down here. Because I, and I want to abolish these because I think we live right now in a time in history when it's better to grow old than any other time before. For example, did you know that people in America whose ages are 65 or older have a higher income than the national average? It's not to say that all people live in prosperity, but higher than average. Have you ever heard the myth about, oh, I don't want to grow old and go to a nursing home? You know, isn't that a fear you've heard and sometimes maybe have Do you realize that only 5% of all Americans age 65 and over ever go to a nursing home? Did you know that? Only 5%. Uh, one thing is that, you know, that, that when you get old, you begin to become paranoid and afraid and so forth. One recent study showed that older people cope with stress extremely well and bounce back from crisis situations better than their younger peers. <laughs> Especially in this generation, they're the folks who had to go through the Depression anyway, in a world war. They know how to bounce back. People in retirement age are making greater contributions to, to business and to science and to society at large. Uh, I think about Colonel Sanders. He's one of my heroes. He was 75 years old when he started Kentucky Fried Chicken. 75 years old, drawing a Social Security check. A retired railroad worker. And look at what he did. Isn't that amazing? So don't, don't assume that as you grow older you have to stop. Gray hair is a blessing from the Lord. Now the second thing as you're growing older together after understanding aging is to accept your role as a grandparent. Cultivate and accept your role as a grandparent. I realize that not old, old, all older couples are grandparents. Sometimes they've not had the privilege of being parents. But most older couples are grandparents. And what a glorious opportunity that is. I think about what Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.5 when he said, Timothy, as a young man, I see your faith. But when I look at you, you know what I think about Timothy? I think first, you remember, of your grandmother Lois and then your mother Eunice. Isn't that great? He said, you're just a chip off the old block, Timothy. I love what I heard not long ago, the acorn falls close to the tree. You see, grandparents have an opportunity to provide that spiritual development 
in a little more remote way than the parents because typically now, particularly in our non-agrarian setting, we don't live under the same roof. Listen to Psalm 71, verse 18. I like this. Even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, O God, till I declare your power to the next generation. See, as you're growing older in marriage, understand you've got a responsibility to your grandchildren to pass on matters of faith to them. That's so important. One of the great blessings that I've had, when my wife and I married, and we were both 22 at the time, seven of our eight grandparents were living. Seven of our eight grandparents. In fact, we buried the last one. This, I'm 39 now. We buried the last one just this past summer. What a blessing to be able to have those grandparents. I think about the wisdom and the training, the influence they've been on my life. That's part of what you do as you grow older. You look at the role you can fill. And our time's about up, but real quickly, what about that third phase, the death of a spouse? I don't know what there is to say about that much. It's just the hardest thing that anybody can ever go through. I say that not from personal experience, though I've watched my mother do that. And I've stood at the head of many a casket and looked at the widow, sometimes the widower, and I've tried to see into their heart, I've tried to feel their pain, and they've tried to describe it. I have a feeling that when David wrote in the 23rd Psalm, yea, I, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that the valley of the shadow of death that's the most frightening is not your own death, but the death of your mate. That's the part that's harder to deal with. What do you do? You do what David did. You trust God. But I want to suggest that you do a second thing. Look at point B here. You also, as, as, as you have to experience that, and sooner or later, if you're not the spouse who dies, the other, you, you will be the spouse that does. Develop supportive relationships. One of my favorite stories in the Old Testament is from the book of Ruth. The story of Ruth and Naomi, remember? Both of them were widowed. Naomi said to Ruth, won't you just go back to your own people? Your chances are better there. Your odds are better. And what did Ruth say to Naomi? We, we use it in marriage ceremonies, even though it was said two women each to the other, one woman to the other, entreat me not to leave you or return from following you. For whether you go, I will go. For you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. You see, life does have to carry on. And even after the death of a spouse, supportive relationships can make life meaningful until the time when we're all on the other side. Well, I appreciate all of you being here for our series and all of you viewing at home. We appreciate you joining us too. Let's close with a word of prayer. Would you bow with me? Great God, we praise your name today. We thank you for your divine wisdom and for the way you take care of us in every possible way. We're thankful more than anything, Father, for Jesus Christ who died on that cross, for the forgiveness offered there 2,000 years ago, and for the way that even these two millennia after we can claim that forgiveness by obeying the gospel. We thank you for your church that was purchased with that blood, the church, that holy bride that is our comfort one to another. But Father, as we conclude this series, we're also extremely grateful for marriage, that plan from the very beginning of time. And Father, our prayer is that this series, for those who've watched it, will help bless marriages, that they will indeed be for keeps, that they will last a lifetime. Father particularly be with those who have lost mates after years and years of being together and comfort their hearts and help us to be an encouragement to those folk as we meet them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you live for Jesus and be always pure and good? Would you walk with Him within the narrow road? Would you have Him bear your burden, carry all your Each week during our For Keeps series, we have had Dr. Gail Napier with us. and He's given one or two tips along the way about how to make your marriage good, and healthy, and enjoyable. And so as we conclude our series, Gail's with us one more time, and I know you're going to benefit from this piece of counsel. You've probably observed in popular magazines a rash of articles on self-esteem. We all want to feel good about ourselves. We want our children to feel good about themselves. 
I think one of the foundation planks of a good marriage is to have good self-esteem. The Lord said, love your neighbor as yourself. And if I can't love grace, probably it's because I don't like me. In marriage, I perceive it as this way. I love me so much that I will not allow grace to hurt me. At the, in the same way, I love grace enough that I will not allow her to, to hurt me. That's good self-esteem. I think there are probably four very important ingredients that make up self-esteem. Let me identify these, and as I do, think about ways you could put these into your marriage. Number one ingredient is to feel loved. The very fact that I have invaluable worth, God made me in his image, gives me that feeling of value, that I am worthy. 25% of my self-esteem comes from feeling that I'm loved. Number two, that I have a place to go, that I fit, that I belong somewhere. In a family setting, children should always feel like that they can come home and everybody will make a place for them. Don't ever say to a child, this is my house. This is our house because feeling like that I belong here is part of my self-esteem. The third ingredient is to have some success. Parents ought to be talent scouts to find out what their kids' gifts are and stroke those gifts and talents because they need some success. As an adult, I need some success. 25% of my self-esteem comes from successes. The last one is the word responsibility. In counseling terms, sometimes we use the word power. I have power over my life to be responsible. If I have all four of these, life is going to be a bed of roses. If I just have three, I'll make it. I might get a few kicks in the backside, but I'll make it. If I have only two or one, then I might need some help. May I challenge you that as you work on your marriage to love yourself enough that you can love your spouse and develop self-esteem in your relationship. Since we're concluding our series for Keeps, uh, it's also the last opportunity you're going to have to either call the number that's on the screen now or to write at the address and receive one of these beautiful brochures for Keeps, Ten Commandments for Lifelong Marriage. This is a compilation of all the uh, pieces of counsel and advice that Dr. Napier has been sharing with us during this series. And I know you'll want to get a copy. If you've not called in or written in already, make sure you do that this week. Tune in next week as we start a new series, and we're together again on the Amazing Grace Bible Class. Love will be our home, where there are words of kindness spoken, where a vow is never broken, we can live together there. Love will be our home.